we've been through a few, two, three years of uh, pretty much turmoil in our lives with everything going on. And you've heard that your world has been turned upside down, and ours has. You get information from here, information from there, and something in the middle. And do you believe it? None of it. <laughs> you know, it's just, that's just what we're put into. But we're now living in a world that is more and more pro persecuted for recognizing our Creator. You know, it started back, well, probably may, it started when Satan was introduced, but recently it started back maybe in the 60s when they took prayer out of schools. You can't have prayers in schools. It just kept going on and on and on. But we live now in a world that's more and more persecuted for recognizing our Creator. A world where the minority are trying to dictate what the majority can think or do. Where if one person claims to be offended, the whole world must change their way of thinking or acting to match that of the person being offended. It doesn't make sense, does it? It should be the other way around. Whereas good becomes evil and evil becomes good. Not really. But so you be you be the judge. Let's turn to Isaiah five twenty. I know it's in here. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. You see that a lot. Do we glorify God? Or do we deny Him because of peer pressure or political correctness? I would say the former, as peer pressure or political correctness are, for the most part, of the world and the ways of man, which are the ways that lead to death in the end. Let's turn to Proverbs 14.12. There is a way that seems right to to a man, but its end is the way of death. We see that a lot. Recently, a young man, let's call him Pedro, after making a touchdown for a football team, while in the end zone, pointed to the, pointed to the sky, representing heaven, and he thanked God. Thank God for being able to score. Some trying to be politically correct or due to peer pressure complained that they were offended that he recognized God. Resulting in Pedro being reprimanded by a committee and told he may not participate in the upcoming playoffs. Sad, isn't it? but well, because of his display of thankfulness to his creator. Later, this same committee rescinded the threat, saying they were giving him a benefit of the doubt, claiming they were going by the rules. We have rules. You wear a mask, you take it off. You wear two masks, you take them off. You know, or whatever it might be. You, you pick the uh, offense. But, <clears throat> but they were going by the rules. Yet Pedro feels they were taunting, which the majority, truth be known, will find even more offensive, going by the rules. I say anybody around this young man, listening to it and seeing what he did, they would be more offended by what the committee did than what he did. Where and how... Do school boards, committees, politicians get off dictating when and where we can honor God in prayer? Yesterday, our pastor, Mr. Martins, gave a, a sermon concerning loving God, how to do it. 
and we can do it on our own. And we should do it at any time we feel like we need to, without anybody telling us we can't. But they dictate where we can honor God in prayer on the spare of the moment, as did Pedro. Pedro. Now let's say these same people were to get into real predicament. What would they do most likely be doing and turning to? You get military men out here in a foxhole somewhere. They might even be a, an atheist. But you know what? When it gets right down to it, they're going to pray. And they're probably going to pray to God, not their, you know, little idol here somewhere. But they're going to turn to and call on and pray and think about God. They'll deny God as long as things are going good. Okay, going their way. And blame him when things are not going good. But yet beseech him to save them in the end. Do you ever see that? You can, you can see people that live a horrid life, but when it risk gets down to their end of life stuff, they're going to call on God to help them, rescue me. Well, do we obey and glorify God or man? We will take a look later at one example of the prophet Daniel, how he handled being told he could not honor God with consequences. It seems like players cannot pray or coaches pray with their teams before or after a game. This should be a personal choice. This should be freedom of speech, which we're, it's getting less and less available now. Yet we are told in Matthew 1, 1, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds. This can be include prayers or preaching or whatever before man. This is not speaking of spontaneous, on the spur of the moment kind of prayer, such as Pedro's was, but rather be seen by them. We see people, if anybody has been to a large city, and most of us have at one time or another, you'll see people standing on the corner. They get their little placards out here. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm not putting them down, but they get, you see that, and that's all they're doing, you know. But uh, it, it's it's to be seen. It's not actually to honor our God, you know. But rather to be seen. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Let's skip down to verse 5. I have it in my notes. So. But when you pray, you shall not pray like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues or on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. And surely I say to you, they have the reward. That's the reward they're getting. It's just being seen by men. When asked why God was important to him, Pedro said he feels that without God, nothing is possible. God gives us the power and the ability to play the, the sport, he said. And God deserves the credit and the glory. When asked by a reporter if he would do it again, you know what he said? Yes, ma'am. He feels it is just a celebration and it, he will continue to do it as we should do it. Even though this is only a football game, um, how do we measure up? What about when we go to a restaurant, which we'll be going later? I personally find it more offensive to see five people being seated at a table, flipping onto cell phones and texting or calling each other than observing a group saying a prayer or thank, thanksgiving us for their food at the restaurant. That's just a little funny about that. I mentioned earlier... There are examples in Scripture we can look at that encourage us towards obedience and boldness and not arrogance in the Word of God. Please come with me to the chapter 6 of Daniel.
Thomas Daniel. This is during the captivity in, in when they were in captivity. It says, verse 1, chapter 6, it pleased Daniel, or uh, Darius, to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these, three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would not suffer any loss. They're trying to protect the king. Then this Daniel distinguished himself over the, above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought of setting him up over the whole realm. That's a pretty important position. So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel. They didn't like what Daniel was doing. They wanted to get him out of there. Some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. The, the, then these men said, What shall we do? How shall we find a, a charge against the Daniel unless we can find some charge against his concerning the law of his God? So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever, setting themselves up to look good here. All the governors of the kingdom and the administrators and satraps, the counselors and, and advisors have consulted together. You ever see that happen? Yeah, see people push right out the door. Consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that who, whoever petitions any god or man for thirty days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish a decree and sign it, the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, where we're told to do, you can close your door, open, hit his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees, Three times that day, prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom from early days. So he had done this all his life. He didn't just pick this time to do it because they set up this decree. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within thirty days except you, king, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? Well, the king answered and said, The thing is true. According to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and, <clears throat> and said before the king, that, Dan that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard to you or respect. So, O king, or the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself, not with Daniel, but with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till going down till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then this man approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which a king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the lion's den. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve, continue, will deliver you. So he, he trusted that the real God would deliver Daniel. <clears throat> Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might be not might not be changed. 
Then the king went to his palace, spent the night fasting. No musicians were brought before him. Also, he did, could not sleep. Then the king rose very early the next morning and went in haste to the den of the lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? <clears throat> then Daniel said to the king, Oh, Daniel's still alive. The lions didn't eat him up. O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me, because I was found innocent before him, and also, O king, I have done no, done no wrong before you. So the king was exceedingly glad for him, and he commanded that they should take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den. No injuries whatsoever was found on him. You know why? Because he believed in his God. <clears throat> the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. Them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones into pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. I didn't take those lions very long, did it? They did their job. Then the king wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth. Oh, some things changed here. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a new decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, the steadfast forever. And if you would like a, a title for this, be, be steadfast and, <clears throat> excuse me, be steadfast and endure to the end. For he is the living God, a steadfast, and steadfast forever. His kingdom is one which will never be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, and his works, signs, and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel, pros so this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius in the sign and in the reign of. Cyrus, the, the Persian. I remember learning about that when I was a child, hearing about it. Daniel in the lion's den. But I must ask, are we thankful, faithful to God? Do we give the glory to God? Are we going to allow peer pressure or political correctness to dictate that we can no longer show our outward glory to God publicly? We're just beginning to see and feel the persecution. We, well, we the people here in the United States, allow it, much less put up with it. <clears throat> Our last scripture is found in Matthew. Let's go turn to Matthew 13. We will be will we be like him whom the seed was received on stony places? But he receives seed on the stony places. This is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. We see that, we see people come and do it, and they're get really excited. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a little while. For when tribulation and persecution comes, because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Or will be either like the seed on the, on the good ground. Verse 23. But he who receives, receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty.
Again, I ask, how do we measure up? Do we honor and glorify God, or do we bow down to political correctness and peer pressure? Think about it. And pray your kingdom come, you will be done on earth as in heaven.